Muito boa tarde a todos. Good afternoon. I hope you had um, a nice moment to lunch and to go outside, maybe. I'm sorry for the five minute delay on starting the conference, but I think we are ready now. Before introducing the moderator for this first session of the afternoon, the, our second session, um, I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, dear friends of mine and IDLR, the Interreligious Dialogue Working Group in Portugal. We have representatives from the, the Interreligious Dialogue Group. We have Catarina Rodrigues from the Buddhist Union, Ilma Oliveira Rios from the Lusitan Church Anglican Communion, João Magalhães from the Buddha's Light Association, Joaquim Moreira from the Leta Day Saint uh, Church, Karin Hyde from the Baha'i Community. I don't see Karin, but I know I, I saw him. Okay, hello, Karin. Khalid Jamal from the Islamic Community, Miriam Lopes, Presbyter Presbyterian Church, uh, Father Peter Stilwell from the Lisbon Patriarchate Catholic Church, Sara Narciso from the Evangelical Alliance, Surya Kala Changalal, Hindu Community, Zohora Pirbai from the Ismaili community. So welcome you all. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Uh, I would like to say that all the session that we are going to have, it's going to be in English, the first three speakers. But uh, my dear friend Joaquin Franco, who is a journalist from CNN, um, he has a highly uh, qualified use of the Portuguese language. He speaks English quite well, but he says he wants to use his uh, native language to say precisely what he wants to say. So he's going to say it in Portuguese. So you are going to need your earphones for the final remarks. But I think you will summarize something in English too, right, Joaquim? Thank you so much. Pedro Torres is the Secretary General of IDLR France and is going to be our host and moderator for the, this session. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Paulo. And um, now I have the pleasure to introduce to you these uh, wonderful people that I have on my left. We need to talk about the people, not only the, the, the responsibilities also. But now they're here because of another reason, not the, but because of who they are. <laughs> uh, the first, uh, in first instance, we have um, the president of uh, the International Religious Liberty Association, which is uh, Dr. Ganon Diop. And uh, he is also the responsible and the director of the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty of the Seventh-day Adventist Church worldwide, the headquarters in Washington, D.C. And uh, he is also the secretary of the Conference of uh, Secretaries of Christian World Communions. And of course, he is a honorary committee, a member of the committee of the IADLR here in uh, the Europe chapter. So, Dr. Diop, the floor is yours. Uh, you have 40 minutes. I have to say, I have been tasked with controlling the time. I will be impeccable. <laughs> He just told us he has special power, but he forget we have freedom of expression here, so. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, so um, I thought it would be really helpful if I would use the, um, the screen and read my text with you. Uh, precisely, that will help me um, stay within the time allocated. I would like to thank Paolo, maybe as uh, the, before the screen comes. Okay. I would like to thank Paolo Macedo for the invitation and uh, for our partnership. You know, now uh, in many places. So this is a very prestigious conference and the quality of the presentation so far, very impressive. So thank to all the presenters. My uh, topic will be meanings, roots, and justifications for freedom of expression. But I would like to um, focus on incontrovertible perspectives. Uh, maybe a brief reminder, some of this has been said already uh, this, this morning, but I thought just maybe just a brief review here. At the most basic level, Freedom of expression is often associated with, with freedom of speech. And of course, the reference text in international law, usually Article 19 of the UDHR, expresses it as follows. Everyone has a right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes free freedom to hold 
opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas, etc. Expanded the UK Article uh, 10, you know, on, of the Human Rights Acts expresses it as follows. Just some snapshots here. Everyone has a right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to hold opinions and to receive almost the same text. But then uh, it, uh, it continues by saying, this article shall not prevent states from requiring the licensing of broadcasting, television, and cinema enterprise, and so forth. And then, of course, the exercise of these freedoms, notice, now uh, a concept is introduced. It, uh, since it carries with it duties and responsibilities may be subject to such formalities, conditions, restrictions, and penalties, etc. Then let me continue. To underline now the importance of our topic, one can further note that freedom of expression is an integral part of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. For example, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting of or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, the premise of the following presentation is that freedom of expression, in fact, presupposes other freedoms. Freedom of thought and conscience, for example, is a prerequisite and justification of all freedoms, including fr freedom of expression. Conscience is the deepest expression, in fact, of human dignity, which also justifies all human rights. It may be in order, before delving to the specifics of freedom of expression, to clarify what is meant by freedom of religion or belief. These two freedoms, in fact, freedom of conscience, freedom of belief or religious freedom, and freedom of um, expression intersect in very significant ways. In the UDHR, their adjacent positions are not accidental. One is Article 18, the other one is Article 19. I don't think this is by chance. There is here a, a, a connection that is worth noting. But what is religious freedom? also called freedom of religion or belief, freedom of thought, conscience, religion, or belief. I may define this religious liberty as the right to profess, to practice, and to propagate one's belief without coercion, restrictions, other than when the forum externum, the public manifestation of the internal forum requires such limitations. And here, of course, I could expand to uh, uh, international law very clearly specifying what are the conditions that would justify a government, for example, to limit freedom of religion or religious liberty. Now, the scope of this freedom, religious freedom, can be considered in the fact that religious liberty is multidimensional. Sometime, and unfortunately, and you mentioned that brilliantly this morning, because of the polarization, and the conflicts of opinions and even philosophies and so forth, people tend to reduce the scope of religious freedom. However, religious liberty or religious freedom or freedom of conscience, thought, and uh, religion or belief is actually multidimensional. So I'm going to run very briefly to some of the aspects that need to be factor, uh, factored in in order to have, uh, I think, a more a workable definition of, uh, or holistic, or comprehensive definition of religious freedom. First of all, it is the political principle. At the most basic level, freedom of thought, conscience, religion, or belief undergirds, in fact, the other political principles, such as consent of the governed, limited government, rule of law, democracy, and even representative government. Two, religious liberty or freedom of religion or belief is actually a legal provision, it has been stated several times in international law, for example, and as you uh, well know, is enshrined in the uh, UDHR Article 18, the European Union, African Union agencies, OAS, Organization of American States, ASEAN, and other international institutions, and also national constitutions. Three, 
religious liberty or freedom of religion or belief is a compound freedom because it presupposes itself, freedom of thought, conscience, belief, conviction, and further, it translates into freedom of choice, etc., etc., of uh, assembly and association. But yes, number four, it is a human right. Now here, I will limit myself in this context to say that the right aspect is often emphasized, and for good reasons. But there is more to a human right than just the right aspect. Allow me to say the human aspect should not be neglected. And these four anthropological, theological, philosophical, and existential reasons. So um, this is really one of the major emphasis that I would like to make here. Uh, we, we, and it's useful, absolutely necessary to emphasize the legal aspect. But, and I think you mentioned that, even what it means to be human <laughs> is disputed nowadays. However, it is core to what we are talking about. I mean, how can we even defend human rights if we don't, for example, accept the full humanity of people? You know? So there is here something that needs to be, maybe, uh, that needs to nurture our conversation. Now, Freedom of thought, conscience, religion, or belief is also a sign in that respect of our humanity, not only because of our rationality or human consciousness, but also because of our sense of moral and ethical responsibilities. Now, six, religious freedom is also, or freedom of conscience, religion, or belief, is also a symbol of our interconnectedness because of what we have in common, again, not just consciousness, but human conscience as an inner, if I may say, sanctuary where only the conscience bearer has access and eventually for those who uh, adhere to that a divine being. Now, seven, it is also a call to solidarity, respect, and tolerance based and I here emphasize another idea, the sacredness of every human being. I know, usually, sacrality, sanctity is limited to places, you know, like holy sites, for example, and that's okay. But I may postulate that the human person is actually a locus of sacrality in itself. That doesn't mean this is tied to an organized religion or something like that. So, and this is now uh, um, developed under further in eight, a seal of sacredness. That is, in monotheistic religions, human beings are sacred, created in the image of God, or representative of the divine, or in Asian religions, connected to the divine. Right? So obviously, I'm not going to develop here uh, those aspects where we talk about Brahman, you know, uh, and, uh, and so forth. Now, freedom of thought, conscience, religion, is also a moral imperative. How can I say that? In fact, it is a deterrent against authoritarianism, totalitarianism, against the trampling of human dignity, against the reduction of human beings to domain, to domesticate, in fact, to dominate and to domesticate. Uh, this is probably one of the core problems the human family faces, the issue of domination. I mean, <laughs> when we think about even the word, and this will apply to freedom of expression, I will come to that in a minute, but this impulse to dominate other, right, and reduce human beings to domain, right, to domesticate, uh, th this is at the foundation, uh, in fact, of ill, a social ill, and you, we, we can think about these uh, abduction, slavery, uh, human trafficking, the, all have one common denominator. We have to reduce the human person into something beneath that person's dignity. So also then uh, I can say here that uh, freedom of religion or belief is also an expression of the immeasurable value of every human being. This ladder gives a glimpse of why in some traditions uh, even God embraced the human nature, for example. Now, foundationally then, freedom of conscience is constitutive to what it means to be human. But still more profoundly, and this has been just alluded to briefly, freedom of conscience is part of the image of God after which humans has, have been, has been created. Uh, it is also inseparable from human dignity, 
grounded on the choice of God, the creator, for those who embrace this vision of, uh, uh, of life. There are other versions, obviously, and respectable that we also honor. Because for the sake of, di uh, for the sake of diversity and uh, respecting human dignity, in fact. So one of the theses I would like to highlight in this keynote address is that what is true about the nature of freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, or belief? You know, what I just mentioned briefly, a political principle, a legal, I mean, part of international law, all that, in fact, applies also to freedom of expression. Now, on freedom of expression, having listened to everything that was said this morning, very rich, I chose to highlight a faith-based perspective this afternoon. Exploring our topic then from philological, philosophical, and theo-anthropological perspective, freedom of expression is related to the most personal, in fact, in a human being. How can I say that? In fact, one of the Greek words uh, translated or, or to translate the word expression is in fact character. Uh, I could hear, for example, mention in the biblical New Covenant book of Hebrews, refer to the concept of high Christology. It is stated that Jesus, in this case, is an expression of divine substance. Literally, the Greek text says uh, that of, uh, of him, he is in fact the apogasmates, uh, Doxes, the radiance of his glory, and then the text says, character tes hypostase was out to. Character of his substance. Now, obviously, the word substance is self explanatory. It indicates what stands beneath the being and which sustains the existence of the whole self, the unique individuality specific to each person. Character substance here, rather. The concept of expression now, as in freedom of expression, is related to the most personal inner being, that is, the expression as understood in this context comes from the depth of, one be of one's being. It stands for what is unique, personal, impossible to duplicate. To emphasize this point, what is expressed outwardly is unique to the person in the depth of his or her being from whom it originates. Consequently, depriving a person of his or, or her freedom of expression is to deny that person of his or her humanity and ultimately his or her existence. This is what is at stake here. What is unique about that person is stifled, prevented to be expressed. In fact, freedom of expression, therefore, is, is constitutive, and I'm being redundant here by saying this on purpose, to what it means to be human. We take away freedom of expression from a human being. In fact, we cancel that person's humanity. Now, it is not about just one's voice, but also one's personality, character, one's uh, uh, that is the expression of one's unique, irreplaceable being. What is at stake, then, is someone's unique personhood when we talk about. Now, again, forgive me to emphasize these more uh, theological, religious, anthropological, uh, philosophical uh, uh, concept, precisely, of freedom of expression, because it counts. It needs to be brought into the conversation. Again, what is expressed is the substance that supports the whole edifice, may I say, of a human person. Now, since the issue is, is, is that of character and its unique role in the life of a person as expression of substance, freedom of expression is a sine qua non, without which the dignity intrinsic to all human beings is snatched out and rendered senseless. Life itself is thus rendered meaningless. No wonder the instrumentalization of people. Right? We, we may think about this. 
the in instrumentalization of people and the cancellation of their identity or identities begins with the denial of their freedom of conscience, of expression, choice, and of course, other freedoms, but fundamentally freedom of conscience and of expression. I, I, I used to say, you know, if really this freedom of thought, conscience, religion or belief was respected, there would be no conquest. There would be no slavery. Why? Because people will be allowed to exist. Now, from a faith-based perspective, again, freedom of expression is part of the image of the divine. Since the very concept of God in a Christian tradition, for example, and there are other stories or narratives, is revealed as perichoresis of relationship, communion, communication, benevolent disposition, and love. One would expect that freedom of expression as image of the divine would also yield expressions of communication, benevolent disposition towards others, and the communion, and even love. But <laughs> genuine covenant, in fact, social contracts, and, uh, and I'm not talking about Rousseau here, and truthful and fruitful consultative dialogue is not possible without freedom of expression. A stifled character or personality cannot be a covenant partner. Expressions of love cannot be forced. They must be expressed from the depth of one's character, deepest thought, conscience, choices, actions, from those choices. This is where freedom of expression is inseparable, again, from freedom of thought, conscience, and freedom of belief, of, uh, of choice. What justifies freedom of expression then is that only with it emerges the authentic self from the inner center or inner sanctum, sanctuary, or sacred location of human conscience. This leads me to postulate, then, that freedom of expression is ultimately grounded on the fact that human beings are sacred. Holy sites, and I mentioned these, are usually respected and cause for protection of holy sites uh, have entered contemporary concern. Very good. Temples, cathedrals, mosques, churches, shrines, and other sacred sites are said to be inviolable. So they should be, we are told. The same sacrality and the needed affirmation of right and protection of freedom of expression are at least as important, if not more. Human freedom of expression is essential to every person's very exist, uh, existence. It is tangible, a tangible aspect of personal security. Human security, that is. You know, the emphasis focused on national security, border security, and so forth. Human security is as vital as, as important. Now, however, there are aspects of freedom of expression beyond the limits of the individual far beyond the realm of mere personal privileges. Most certainly, even within the scope of individual rights, the other side of the incontrovertible nature of freedom of, ex of expression is, in fact, the sense of responsibility. You know, this is where, <laughs> in the text of international law I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, what a human being expresses from the depth of one's being cannot indulge, uh, cannot indulge rather in anything detrimental to someone else's being and right to security. A sense of responsibility grounded on human solidarity by virtue of our being human beings uh, brings rather a needed moral accountability. It is inconceivable to consider freedom of expression, for example, as the right to insult other human beings or groups. Inconceivable. The moral dimension uh, of respect of other people's dignity should be inseparable from freedom of expression. Again, anything can be instrumentalized, including freedom of expression. I want to distract you just one second. For the first time since I started speaking, I look at the, the timer, and, and I feel that I'm still all right. So let me continue. <laughs> so <laughs> freedom of expression can never be a license for violence of any kind. What comes 
And here is the real issue. What comes from one's inner being, right, the character, cannot be associated with impulses of death. That is what is at stake here. Out of solidarity to the whole human family, freedom of expression is part of a cluster of freedoms which are, and this has been said also, interrelated, interdependent, and indivisible, as stipulated, by the way, by the Vienna Convention of 1993 when it comes to human rights. They are all interrelated, interdependent, and indivisible. So are the freedoms. In other words, the same principle of interdependency applies not only to human rights, but also to all freedoms. They are related to freedom of expression and to every other freedom. Now, this holistic understanding of freedom of expression is consonant with the pillars of the United Nations, namely, think about it, peace and security, first pillar, justice and development, second pillar, and human rights, a third pillar, but in terms of freedom from fear, freedom from want, and freedom from indignity. So how could a, <laughs> one of the freedoms be used to cancel other freedoms? It will be, I mean, self-contradictory. And this means that the genuine freedom of expression participates in the building of a peaceful and safe world. A just, wait, peace and security. A just and fair world, justice and development and a world of rights, human rights, rule of law, and maybe even, I may speculate, rule of love. Consequently, these dimensions of freedom of expression highlight the fact that there is also a communal aspect to freedom of expression, not just the individualistic and so forth. There is another dimension, and now, just briefly, I would like to expand the borders of freedom of expression. Beginning with the critical question, does the scope of freedom of expression include beyond individual freedom of expression, corporate freedom of expression? Conversation regarding cultural freedom of expression, for example, or even religious freedom of expression may be helpful in our current conversations. Though the latter seems to be included in the right to worship according to one's adopted rituals, for example, yeah. But the continent of Africa, may I highlight here clearly, is a case in point for the, needed, for the need to reflect constructively on the communal dimension of freedom of expression. Major world religions, Christianity and Islam, for example, have been imported through the framework of empire religions. That's a reality. And then, of course, colonialism, domination, coloniality, meaning the whole ecosystem being framed, right, in terms of legacies of colonialism. Now, these religions and the form that they have taken in context, though having gone through several metamorphoses, interwo interwoven with local cultures, <laughs> still, there is a need to reflect even really further about Free cultural freedom of cultural expression. As been said colloquially, throwing the baby with the water of the bath may have discarded genuine riches the human family may have benefited from for the good of all. If, for example, Christianity or Islam have not been culture bound in many ways to impose on other cultures expressions and then, of course, freedom of expression. But that is just part of a conversation that I'm raising could also benefit the whole human family for the sake of reconciliation, for the sake of healing. Because religious expression has, has uh, expressions have stifled identities in ways that need to be revisited somehow. So the premise of foundation of freedom of expression Having been laid, we can, if we had time, pr pr uh, look at the, ramif the legal ramification of such conceptualization. You know, because at the end of the day, some legal provisions will have to be designed or reinforced uh, <laughs> or relearned in order 
to help benefit from the discovery and the, uh, the, the benefits itself of freedom of expression. What is to be protected in freedom of expression and crafted as law and drafted into policies should be connected to the personhood and dignity of the character of every person and expression of that being. Obviously, if such character dysfunctions and create a toxic environment and impair life for others, then the state, obviously, has a responsibility to protect citizens from abuse and harm, whether physical, psychological, or spiritual, as pertaining to one's belief, for example. Yes. But the right to freedom of thought, conscience, choice, and expression should be the prerogative of every human being, every human person. This has been said, and I think we will have a consensus un un unquestionably about this one thing. And this can be even called an inalienable right and as such should be protected. The imperative of protecting freedom of conscience is grounded then in the fact that conscience is the inner voice that deserves to be voiced, yes. But this imperative of protecting freedom of expression resides in the respect and even honor of expression emerging from the depth of a person's dignity or substance. Just one brief concluding remark here to say, and we will have about 10 minutes to interact. Uh, and I do this just so that he will not have anything to say about my presentation. So that's just the freedom of expression is part of international law, unquestionably. National constitution, no question. But it is also constitutive to what it means to be human. And this is connected unquestionably to every person's raison d'être. Why we here, unique, irreplaceable, we cannot be duplicate. Well, because there's something of our substance as, as human beings that needs to be uniquely expressed and be received and tolerated as long as it doesn't harm others. And this is why it is connected to freedom of conscience freedom of thought, right? Uh, freedom of choice, right? Because all those freedoms are definitely inter interrelated. But freedom of expression is a necessity. But obviously, there are limitations, and international law is very clear about all those. So we have about uh, 10 minutes. And uh, to just give the mic. I will open the floor later. So. <laughs> If you don't mind, <laughs> I will invite the audience to write down the questions. So oh. we will yield the, the place now to the next speaker. And then at the end, we will have plenty of time to ask together. Otherwise, we cannot control the time of questions Do and I answers. Do I have the freedom to object to that? Or no? You have the freedom to object, but I have the freedom to say no. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ganon Diop. Thank you so much for sticking to the time. <laughs> and now we have our next guest, and I had to say that I was wrong, which is uh, Dr. Um, Elisaveta Kitanovic, and I have to, I love to say ch, <laughs> because not everyone says that. She is the Executive Secretary of Human Rights of the Conference of European Churches, in Brussels, she works as a human rights advocate with international organizations worldwide. Mrs. Kitanovic completed her theological and doctoral studies at the Faculty of Political Science in Belgrade. She graduated from the Diplomatic Academy in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Serbian government. And she also regularly gives lectures and presentations in the field of human rights. And that's why she's here today. She speaks English, French, Greek, and Serbian. And she has pity of me. Thank you for being so patient. <laughs> now the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, just uh, we have some small updating of the computer right before the presentation appears. Okay, 
Here we go, we can start. So um, first, uh, I would like to thank, <laughs> thank you, uh, uh, to the organizers for inviting me, for inviting Conference of European Churches. Thank you, Paolo Gannon, Mercedes, for a wonderful welcome. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, with you and it's absolutely fantastic being in Lisbon and in Portugal because uh, we have also our members here. I'm very happy that Miriam and uh, representatives of Copica are also here and greetings from Conference of European Churches to all of you as well to all the friends from international organizations to, from UN and other organizations who are here. So I will do something a little bit differently uh, than the previous speakers because I will speak a little bit from practitioner's point of view. And uh, as I come from Serbia, um, I have born and raised, was born and raised in a communist country and was very much aware of what does it mean, limitation of freedom of expression. So uh, it was amazing, really fantastic to hear about all these articles granting international legal standards and laws and freedom of expression and freedom of religion or belief. But we know that in some countries that it's not possible still today even though there are international laws, uh, even though there are international legal standards, and we have heard from Naz this morning <laughs> how many countries she has to visit, revisit, write reports, uh, and so on, remind that these standards exist, that they should be um, practiced, granted, implemented, uh, and, and so on and so on. Um, so, uh, practicing uh, freedom of expression, uh, does it mean that we can say everything we want? Uh, where is the red line, uh, what we can say and what we are supposed to say or we are what, what we are not supposed to say? Uh, we have been actually uh, in Conference of European Churches uh, exactly here in Portugal in 2019. We organized summer school on freedom of expression uh, with support of Coimbra University and Professor Jonathan Machado, but also colleagues here from Portugal and also uh, Professor Ganun Diop and many other colleagues, and we have been discussing where is this line, red line uh, between uh, freedom of religion uh, or belief and belief and freedom of uh, expression. And we have seen that actually that is very uh, com complicated, um, let's say, uh, gray zone. Uh, that as Rosa Maria mentioned this morning, we have to deal from case to case and to find out really what is the best in each <coughs> single situation and that it's not easy uh, to find out and of course requires lots of different perspectives what uh, Ganun was referring and philosophical, theological, anthropological, sociological, security and so and so and so on and CNN too probably. <laughs> So uh, to, go <laughs> to go further, so uh, dealing with freedom of expression, uh, ESCAC and the freedom of religion or belief, we have sort of several publications where, of course, we have been looking freedom of expression of religious minorities. What does it mean when you are really minority? Can you really express yourself publicly? publicly? What does it mean? We have uh, seen today in presentation Professor Machado who say enemy of the enemy, <laughs> it's again internal or external enemy. So we have all these sort of issues which are referring to freedom of uh, expression. And then because of all of these uh, different freedom of expressions who can be problematic or less problematic, they can bring us sometimes in trouble and they can be presented in the public sphere differently. And if they are abused, let's say, this freedom of expression that we say that we offend, hurt, uh, manipulate religious feelings, then in the public sphere we can cause actually lots of troubles. And then we come to the European Union because I'm uh, based in Brussels, as the seat of the Conference of European Churches is there. And European Union and European Commission have issued the action plan to support the protection of public spaces. And what public spaces has to do with freedom of expression? It is a very interesting question. Well, when we have, for example, I will just show you this uh, photo uh, slide. When we have terrorist attacks, like we had in Berlin 2016, Barcelona 2017, London 2019, Paris 2019, we have Brussels terrorist attack. Um, just a few days ago, somebody was stabbing people in Brussels, uh, just uh, across our um, office <coughs> in the public sphere, in the metro station, people all, all, all of a sudden without knowing who is the person and, and so on and so on. 
we see that something is actually happening with freedom of expression in the public sphere. And uh, we have been engaged as CAC in the last two years with the project called Safer and Stronger Communities in Europe. So there are three publications here that I will show you. You can find them on saske.eu website. They are translated in 15 languages. Uh, and we have been dealing with the protection of the worship places. And why that it's important, Ganun, you have mentioned uh, worship places in your presentation and the way what we are saying in the public um, places, in the, uh, we, because <coughs> worship places are also part of the public spaces. Because when we had the different terrorist attacks of synagogues or mosques and so on, um, or uh, maybe uh, religious hatred being promoted in some of the worship places, that also was uh, influencing the safety and security of all of us in the public space. And uh, we don't know who is going to be in the public space. Are we going to be one day, I don't know, at a train station where terrorist attack is going to happen, or in the school, or in the supermarket, like we had cash market um, in Europe, in France, and so on? We don't know. So this is, I would like to invite you to um, uh, go to this website when you have time and just a little bit read about this project because it is for the first time, you can imagine that four European organizations, European uh, Jewish Congress, and especially their security and safety center, uh, together with European Buddhist Union, I heard that the colleagues from the Buddhist Union from Portugal are here, as well, the colleagues from the Massim organization, Faith Matters, and the Conference of European Churches, for the first time we have succeeded to organize consortium and to do project in common. So you can imagine, for years we are talking about interreligious dialogue, for years we are talking about religious literacy, for years we are just talking how that's great and nice and we are friends and so on, but to come together and do together, well, that's something else. And uh, so what we have been doing in the past two years, each of the community actually uh, collected every month, every single month, uh, let's say um, violation of, um, uh, let's say, um, and, and the incidents in the public space. Here you can just see inside of the European Union because project relates to, uh, to the uh, 14 countries inside of the European Union. But of course, there are also countries outside of the European Union who also have the problems with the freedom of religion or belief. And uh, this is also free, uh, freedom of expression, just the very negative one. So the, what we can see when the places and worship places are simply uh, attacked during, um, because they represent what Ganun likes to emphasize, integrity, identity, dignity, and so on of the individuals and communities, people get attacked because of uh, that. Uh, here on this slide, you can see, for example, a swastika on the, um, actually five of them, but on this image, it's only one in Germany. This is just a part from the report from September 2020 uh, all in Göttingen. And um, so this is in the, I think, in the mosque. So they have uh, go, went, to the, uh, the believers there, the worshippers there, and they, then they could see this, this is also freedom of expression, just a negative one. Uh, then in France, we had attacks on mosques and uh, with Molotov co cocktails, so people are sending messages all the time in the public sphere, so whether they're positive or they're negative. And of course, uh, that uh, also shows uh, what is the situation um, on, the, on the ground and how it's actually difficult to deal uh, with religion, in fact, in the public sphere. This is a Muslim cemetery which was destroyed in December 21. And of course, we had in 2019 a Halle attack on Yom Kippur and so on. I'm not going to go, this is very disturbing uh, um, video about the attacks on the Jewish community and so on. But we can see these are the consequences, consequences of freedom of expression in the public sphere, uh, um, also empowerment of politicians. Uh, John Tom was speaking about uh, populism, I think in his uh, pre presentation was mentioning also this encouragement of people to go uh, and to, um, I don't know, like uh, violate, uh, let's say the rights of one community or another and so on. 
This is only one tweet from the MEP from European Parliament that we actually uh, collected in our report. It relates to the freedom of expression as well uh, because it is about uh, Serbian Orthodox Church heritage in Kosovo, which says it must be protected and enjoy full rights. And of course, uh, some others uh, were thinking that it's not, uh, that this religious community uh, simply doesn't have the rights to protect uh, and, and so on. So I have mentioned to you that um, we have collected the, the incidents which re also relate to freedom of expression. Uh, you can see the type of prob uh, probability, severity and action which we're taking. So we have been collecting for already two years in our reports, online uh, and social media abuse cases uh, from a Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist and Christian communities like insult and harassment, then we had vandalism and graffiti, desecration, theft, terrorism, kidnapping, violent assault, stabbing, hostage taking, car. I mean, you can see that uh, aggravation, it goes further down. And uh, what we could uh, notice is, first of all, we didn't know that all of these communities are suffering from the, let's say, same disease, that we all have a problem. So when we put this report, we were surprised what we found in the report and what was uh, the countries <coughs> who were reporting the most. Of course, the biggest problem with all of these issues, uh, because I have been working uh, with um, Christian communities, was simply to stimulate people to report human rights violations. Because people don't trust the system, they don't trust the law, they don't trust the implementation. I mean, usual story that all the lawyers, they, 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 they do. But if we leave the things as they are, if we leave them unrecorded, it means we agree with such an expression of negative feelings and or <laughs> negative attitudes and we accept them as society and say, yeah, fine, that's fine. It, it's great that you have sprayed the, I don't know, like facade of the church or, or, or anything else. But then another problem is if we are dealing with the rights of religious minorities, who pays for the damage? Who pays for repairing the facade of the church? especially if we have a small religious minority, it doesn't matter whether it's church or Jewish community or a Muslim community or any <coughs> other community, any other Christian community or Baha'i or, or um, a Sikh community, or, I don't know, there are so many. Who pays for it? Who pays for it? It's not recorded, it's not in the police system, no one is looking for the perpetrators and then the community has all these costs, you know, like to face uh, because of uh, this, um, yeah, violations. So this is the how this report looks like. Um, so in order to, let's say, avoid all these lines, like let's say from the legal point of view, different courts, like, and also somehow helping the spread of information which comes directly from the religious communities, we have created this report and we send it every month to the European Commission, to DG Home. This is DG Home for Home Affairs where they see directly from the religious communities what is the situation. So not from the newspapers, sorry, uh, <laughs> Joaquin from CNN. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> really they have direct line through this channel and then they inform with the language that they can present in the way that they feel what happened actually to their own community. Uh, and uh, they uh, simply have to work on this and sometimes European Commission reacted Sometimes um, uh, they ask for more information. Sometimes there was a silence of our administration as we all know that it happens. By uh, going um, through Europe, I have done 12 countries and I could do, let's say, comparison analysis on the risk threats um, and challenges, terrorist uh, risk threats and challenges, uh, let's say, in these countries. I mean, uh, we could see, for example, that far-right uh, <coughs> individuals and small groups are uh, very active. We could see something that there is Siege culture. I don't know, maybe people from the Nordic part of the Europe, uh, they are more familiar with it. I was uh, at least not the first time I heard and learned from the State Department, from the Ministry of Defense, right? In US, what do you have? Defense reports or something like that. Um, so I could see that uh, simply some countries have been reacting on this. Uh, but of course, uh, when there is freedom of expression and when we have, um, let's say, um, I don't know, like uh, issues with terrorism, there is a red line and there is a gray line, what goes to media, what goes to the public, how and when do we communicate and so on. 
Another provocation I will just go, which goes also in line with freedom of expression and dignity. Let's go to the dignity of religious communities. What we could notice in Europe are simply cases of legal provocation linked to the freedom of religion or belief, like right to circumcision, right to re ritual slaughter. We know that that refers to the uh, Muslim communities mainly and the immigration, which is there, but also her Jewish community. Then we have rights of anti-Semitism <coughs> as well. And of course, as churches, uh, we have to react also. We cannot pretend that it's not our issue, <laughs> okay? It's not us who are concerned, who need halal food or, or circumcision or uh, any of these um, issues. But uh, we need to say something in the public sphere. We need to take responsibility for what is happening uh, in the public sphere. And in France, I saw that tomorrow there are going to be two presentations um, by John um, and uh, Cla Monsieur Cal uh, Clavier. Yeah, uh, these, are, these are recorded incidents in 2021 in France. <laughs> and this is just because uh, we can see that there was an investigation 1,659 anti-religious acts in 21, and you do remember that uh, the Minister of Interior of France introduced a new law, actually where there is a little bit of scrutiny of religious communities. So, freedoms in one way, security in another way. So where is the red line? Yeah, how do we balance? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, and just uh, to finish, this is the last slide, uh, and I see my time, it's also uh, uh, going away. Um, uh, I have been also here running this training on the security um, protection of the worship places in Portugal, and we could see that actually Portugal has very good laws, and uh, at least this is what I found. I, I don't know how, how um, let's say, uh, update the information is, but we could see that the law on combating terrorism was amended in 2015. I don't know if there was afterwards amended, um, and uh, we could see, I will just see here, that uh, the criminal punishment of terrorism held also some effects on restricting the scope of freedom of expression. And in this context, some actions such as incitement, terrorism uh, apology, uh, and are criminally punished. So there are legal provisions in uh, Portuguese law. And as we have been talking many years about religious literacy, I just want to uh, communicate that we have done one small guide for law enforcement for judges, lawyers, police, and so on. And these are only cha four chapters about four religions. And when you Google how many religions are, there are about 4,200. <laughs> so imagine how <laughs> thick this book actually should be and how many volumes actually there should be. But European Commission agreed to just sponsor this for what means that there is lots of work <coughs> Uh, to do, and uh, yeah, we have to discuss and continue discussing where the red lines between freedom of expression and freedom of religion and all other fundamental freedoms. Thank you. Thank you for sticking to the time. <laughs> now it's the turn of uh, Dr. Asher Maoz which is someone that uh, we need to respect a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. You I'm very... <laughs> we, need, we, ha we need and we must and we, we, we respect. Um, he's a founding dean, uh, founding the dean of Paris Academic Law School, head uh, committee of international academic relations. Professor Maos has taught at leading universities around the world. So I, I just will save all the list. <laughs> That's why I say that. <laughs> and uh, of course, he is um, honorary vice president of the IDLR and member of uh, the committee of uh, IRL, IRLA experts as well. He served as academic advisor to the Knesset on adopting the constitution of the state of Israel. This is something historic and was chair of the state of commission of journalists privilege. He authored several books. He has published hundred, over hundred academic articles and book chapters. So that's, a, that's a, only for you an encyclopedia. <laughs> and he's the vice, vice president now of the IADLR. Thank you, the floor is yours. And uh, you have 
20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I'm being often asked what's the difference between a vice president and an honorary vice president. Let me tell you there is no difference save for one thing. The honorary vice president is not on the payroll. <laughs> However, <laughs> I'm rewarded by working for such a worthy cause as the AIDLR stands for and working with dear friends like Adama Mario, Paolo, Mercedes, and many others. Freedom of dispute in the Jewish state. I, by the way, I should have known better not to accept to speak after Ganun and Elisabetta, but it's too late now. <laughs> and uh, I've been approached by so many of you in Hebrew that I was considering presenting in Hebrew. I won't do it today, but <laughs> it's a fair warning. My next presentation will be in Hebrew, so prepare. <laughs> Uh, freedom of dispute in the Jewish faith. Yeah. A dramatic event took place in the southern town of Yavne to where the Sanhedrin, the high court of ancient Israel, moved after the destruction of the second temple. The event evolved around the sanctification of the month. <clears throat> the Jewish calendar combines lunar months with the solar year. A new month begins with the rebirth, so-called, of the new moon. The proclamation of a new month is of utmost importance as the religious festivals are set in accordance with that declaration. Nowadays, the beginning of the month is determined according to set charts. However, when the Sanhedrin existed, the new moon was proclaimed on the basis of its observation by witnesses. The oral law, the Mishnah, describes a disagreement between Rabban Gamliel, president of the Sanhedrin, and Rabbi Joshua, an eminent scholar, regarding the reliability of witnesses to the new moon. Rabbi Joshua was of the opinion that their testimony did not make sense, while Rabban Gamliel accepted it. The Mishnah tells us, Rabban Gamliel sent him a message. I decree that you must appear before me with your staff and coins on the day which, according to your calculation, would be Yom Kippur, which would have been the secretion of the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. Rabbi Joshua was in distress. However, we are told that in the end, he took his staff and his coins and went to Yavne to Rabban Gamliel on the day of Yom Kippur, according to his calculation. Rabban Gamliel stood up and kissed him on his head and said to him, Go in peace, my teacher and student, my teacher in wisdom and my student in that you followed my words. How does this episode bear on the issue of religious freedom? The answer might be that this was a unique episode that has no relevance to our issue. Sanctification of the month requires declaration by court and as one sage, stated, his decision is final, whether right or wrong. We may draw moreover from that episode an important conclusion. While there is freedom of thought and expression, it is not so with action. For Rabban Gamliel admitted that justice might have lied with Rabbi Joshua, yet he was forced to act in accordance with the court's ruling. This distinction is even more emphasized in the case of the rebellious elder. Torah tells us that a matter too hard to judge should be brought before the Levitical priests or the magistrate in charge at the time, and one must act in accordance with the instructions given to you and the ruling handing down, handed down to you, and must not deviate from them. The function was carried out by the great Sanhedrin who served as the final authority on Jewish law, and any scholar who went against its decisions was regarded a rebellious elder and theoretically liable to capital punishment. However, the scholar does not become rebellious merely by teaching his opposite opinion, but only if he instructs others to act in accordance with his 
minority debate, a dissented opinion. We are told in the Talmud of one of the leading sages who was offered the position of president of the Sanhedrin if he rescinds his differing opinions. He rejected the offer, stating that he would rather be called a fool and not become an evil person by giving up the truth as he saw it. The same goes for the crime of discovering a new faces of the Torah, not in accordance with halakha. Halakha is Jewish law, religious law. Again, this crime does not include one who merely teaches a, a conclusion different than that of the sages. The Talmud is full with conflicting opinions, and both majority and minority opinions are regarded to be, and I quote, words of the living God. The Talmud, moreover, does not regard the ruling opinion of the majority as more right. We are even told that the conflicting opinion is reported since in the future it may become the decisive one. A good example is the vigorous debates on, halacha, on halachic matters between two leading schools of thought, that of Hillel and of Shammai. The final law almost always coincides with Hillel because a divine voice was heard declaring a general rule of practice. Both schools expose the words of the living God, but the halacha follows the school of Hillel. We are told, moreover, that halachic practice was decided in favor of the house of Hillel since they were agreeable and forbearing. Interesting, now they were smarter. However, we are also being told that in the messianic era, halacha will follow the school of Shammai. According to one opinion, while halacha follows the school of Hillel, one may choose to follow either Hillel or Shammai as long as he does so consistently. However, if he follows the leniencies of both schools, he is considered evil while if he follows the stringentness of both schools, he is considered a fool. The right to deviate is not restricted to the academic sphere. There is no pope in Jewish religion. Even the instance, the institute of chief rabbi, who is so common the nowadays, has no ground in halakha. And usually, if you look around, the chief rabbis are not the greatest rabbis in the country. The greatest rabbis refused to become chief rabbis because it has no halachic root. And since the abolition of the Sanhedrin, Judaism lacks a central institute that will decide controversial issues. The rule is rather that each and every Jew may choose the rabbi whose ruling he will obey. Referring to this phenomenon, the late Justice Menachem Elon of the Supreme Court of Israel wrote, it is well known that Jewish thought over the ages is full of varying perceptions and conflicting approaches. No litigant finds it difficult to extract from the recesses of the sources some support for his own argument and views. This applies to each and every issue. Certainly, it goes without saying that these approaches and perceptions taken together have contributed to the deepening and enriching of Jewish thought. From this vast and abundant storehouse, the inquirer must draw liberally that which his time and place require, and which they themselves join the treasury of Jewish philosophy and Jewish heritage. Pluralism, says Menachem Elon, is not a negative phenomenon or defect. It is, not, it is of the essence of halakha. It is not a question of inconsistency or deficiency to say, heaven forbid, that the Torah was thereby made into two Torahs. On the contrary, that is the way of the Torah. The utterness of both are the words of the living God. You will find this expression, words of the living God, all over the Talmud. A multiplicity of views and approaches tend moreover to create harmony and uniformity to diversity. In the words of Rabbi Epstein, he was the latest 
the last codifier of the Jewish law, and he says every dispute among the sages in pursuit of, of true understanding constitutes the word of the living God, and each has a place in the halakha. That is indeed the glory of our holy and imminent and immaculate Torah. The whole Torah is called a song, and it is the glory of the song that its different sounds are various and harmonious. Commenting on Rabbi Epstein's words, Elon writes, the halakha is a mighty symphony made up of many different notes. Therein lies its greatness and beauty. In every generation, it needs a great conductor, blessed with inspiration and vision, who can find the interpretation of its many individual notes that will please the ear and respond to the needs of the contemporary audience. <coughs> the Torah is supreme even to its giver, supreme to God himself. The Talmud tells us of a halachic dispute that arose between the sages in which notwithstanding that all the sages disagreed with Rabbi Eliezer, the latter tried to convince his colleagues that justice lay with him. We are told, on that day, Rabbi Eliezer brought forward every imaginable argument, but the sages did not accept them. Said he to them, if Halakha agrees with me, let this carob tree prove it. Thereupon the carob tree was torn a hundred cubits out of its place. Other Ephraim 400, the miracle was not big enough with the hundred. By the way, it shows you that the, the house, the, the Bet Midrash, the house of learning was in the middle of nature, that they could look out of the window and see the carob tree. No proof can be brought from the carob tree, they retorted. Again, he said to them, if the halakha agrees with me, let the stream of water prove it whereupon the stream of water flowed backward. No proof can be brought from the stream of water, they rejoined. Again, he, ur he urged, if the halakha agrees with me, let the walls of the schoolhouse prove it. This is much, much more dangerous and much more dramatic, because listen what happened. Whereupon the walls began to lean, and they would have buried all the, all the sages under them. But Rabbi Joshua, whom we met at the beginning of the presentation, stood up, rebuked them, saying, when scholars are engaged in a halachic dispute, what have you to interfere in that? Hence, they did not fall in honor of Rabbi Joshua, nor did they resume the upright in honor of Rabbi Eliezer. They were, these were the two greatest rabbis of that time. And we are told that if you, we know where that school is, was located, we can still see the walls half, half leaning, they didn't stood up. And, the, and here is the last, the last proof, or he thought so. Again said he to them, if the halakha agrees with me, let it be proven from heaven. <coughs> Whereupon a heavenly voice, namely God himself, cried out, why do you dispute to Rabbi Eliezer, seeing that in all matters of the halakha agrees with him? But Rabbi Joshua arose and exclaimed. He spoke very soft to the walls, but he, was, he screamed towards God, and that's what he said. It is not in heaven. That's how it is in, in the Bible, in the Torah. What did he mean by this? Said Rabbi Jeremiah, explained, the Torah had already been given in Mount Sinai. We pay no attention to a heavenly voice, because thou has long since written in the law at Mount Sinai, after the majority must one incline. So more or less, sorry God, lucky Eliezer is not single, you are two against all of us, you lose. There is an addendum to this story. Rabbi Nathan met Elijah the prophet, well, in an age where the carob trees are torn away and the stream of water go upward, it's not a miracle to, to meet Elijah, I guess. And he met and asked him, what did the Holy One, blessed be he, do in that hour? In that hour? How did he react to such a 
through such a, an episode. He laughed with joy. He replied, saying, my sons have defeated me. My sons have defeated me. Commenting on these two Talmudic passages, the late Justice Moshe Zilberg of the Supreme Court of Israel wrote, here we find the rule of law in the absolute sense of the term, the law ruling the, the law ruling the lawgiver, the inclusion of the legislator himself, God, within the framework of legal and decisional relationships created by the laws given by him. He observes the precepts of the law, submits to the authority of the law, and furthermore, submits to the authentic interpretation given by the interpreters, namely, submits himself to the jurisdiction of an authoritative body, human being, the majority, authorized by him to determine in case of doubt, which for him, of course, is no doubt at all. He knows the truth. If the law is after the majority must one follow, then this rule is to be applied even when God himself is an interested party. Justice Hilberg summarizes, the idea is too great to be grasped by our ordinary mind, but one conclusion certainly rises from it, that the jurisdiction of Jewish law is not confined within boundaries of relation between men and men. Matters concerning the relationship between men and God are caught by the net of legal relations as well. Well, we could go on, but the, the clock goes on as well. So let me conclude by saying, all this said so far is limited to activities within the boundaries of Jewish faith and established rules. Judaism does not accept the right to trespass these boundaries. In cases that might have endangered the existence of Judaism and the future of the Jewish people and faith, the establishment might have reacted sharply, in very rare cases even leading to excommunication. So in conclusion, I would say that it would be accurate to state that Judaism does not recognize freedom of religion for its members. It does sanction, however, freedom within religion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maus, for sticking to the time as well and for this wonderful lecture. Now, I would say that uh, <laughs> Joaquin Franco has 20 minutes because Ganon gave 10, but it was for questions. No, questions. no, 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 the questions come I after. <laughs> and, and two, <laughs> so, and <laughs> but these are adding for the questions. So now is the turn yeah, of... our team should get the medal. <laughs> That's a good one. Now it's the turn of uh, Joaquin Franco, journalist, uh, commentador. <laughs> He's a journalist on religious and liberty um, in, uh, for the CNN, specialist in social and, re and religious issues. So he has been taking notes of whatever you have been saying. I, I've, I've looked at what he wrote, so you risk to be on CNN tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, he writes on moderation, uh, on debates and commentaries and interviews. He's a coordinator as well and editor of Religious and Citizenship for the CNN in Portugal. You have, let's say, 12 minutes. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you for this invitation. And uh, I beg your pardon, but you, you, you have to pick your headphones, please. <laughs> Okay, I will talk in Portuguese. It's better for me, and it, uh, of course, it's better for you, for you. I'm sure it was. And uh, so, if you don't mind, um, after the, the morning words uh, and this presentation, well, I don't have any remarks to do, but it's so clear. But let's try. Liberdade de expressão. Liberdade para dizer para ser, eu diria mais, direito de dizer, direito de ser, direito de ser diferente, mas ser diferente com 
deveres e responsabilidade. Diria até mais, isto é muito mais do que um sentimento religioso, em corresponsabilidade, vai muito mais além. A liberdade, a religiosa, e é dessa que falamos aqui também, exprime-se, entre outras, liberdades. A liberdade de escolher, pensar, a liberdade de consciência, a liberdade de estar no espaço público, admitindo todos os equívocos e limitações que esta presença implica e temos de reconhecer que gera, inevitavelmente, equívocos. Peço-vos desculpa, mas hum, eu sou incapaz de excluir a minha experiência enquanto jornalista e a acompanhar há cerca de 30 anos, mais de 30 anos, o fenómeno religioso e mais de 20 em televisão, com todas as dificuldades que implica, porque o fenómeno religioso não é de fácil acesso aos grandes médias, quando sabemos, e nem sequer é fácil trazer para a agenda do cotidiano jornalístico o tema religião. Eu vivo diariamente com esse constrangimento. A reflexão que faço, a partir do que ouvimos, é precisamente sobre o papel e a presença das religiões na construção da liberdade e na afirmação da diversidade nesta media age, nesta idade média. Em português a expressão idade média é muito curiosa. Que tempo é este? Teríamos de convocar, se calhar, outra, outra conferência só para ensaiar uma resposta a esta pergunta. Que tempo é este? Falamos de liberdade religiosa e de dignidade humana quando sabemos que nenhuma liberdade é integralmente garantida e que a dignidade humana é um propósito. Em alguns locais, quase uma questão de fé. As liberdades podem ser defendidas pela lei, mas isso não garante que sejam respeitadas. Vivemos num tempo de campo aberto, eu diria de um campo aberto, de um campo de convicções. E é aqui que se calhar melhor nos entendemos. É de resto esse campo aberto que permite depois o exercício de fazer perguntas, até, diria, mais perguntas às respostas que julgamos ter, de duvidar, porque neste tempo o que prevalece é a desconfiança, é a dúvida. E esta coisa de fazer perguntas às respostas que julgamos ter, em contexto religioso, e sei que está aqui muita gente que partilha essa, essa função ou esse trabalho, em contexto religioso, onde habitualmente se procuram respostas, às vezes até absolutas, é um tremendo problema. Fazer perguntas às certezas que julgamos ter. E, no fundo, é isso que este tempo mediaticamente nos impõe. Fazer perguntas, duvidar. E, às vezes, nem fazemos perguntas porque as dúvidas transformam em certezas. De todas as liberdades que conseguimos, que, todas as liberdades que conseguimos na, na maturidade socioantropológica, cultural, filosófica, teológica, a liberdade religiosa é, porventura, das que melhor diz a dignidade humana. Das que melhor diz a dignidade humana. Ao lado das outras liberdades que já aqui foram uh, uh, explicadas. E porquê? Porque as religiões, como nós sabemos, podem legitimar a segregação e a exclusão. Ui, e de que maneira? Um livro sagrado, em mãos indevidas ou impreparadas, pode ser um perigo mortal. Mas, na verdade para coexistirem, as religiões têm de afirmar-se exclusivamente na diversidade e na pluralidade, aceitando a diferença. É multidimensional nas experiências da fé e até na ruptura com as estruturas de crença. Aceitar quem não acredita e com esse que não acredita fazer pontos, pontos de coexistência, é já um pressuposto da liberdade religiosa. É a forma mais, diria, mais sublime de afirmar a dignidade humana no contexto religioso. Fazer pontes com quem não acredita. Assume-se em diversidade, e é nesta diversidade, que as lideranças e elites religiosas, ciclicamente, estamos a viver um desses ciclos, procuram caminhos comuns, de entendimento sobre aquilo que é verdadeiramente essencial. Põem em segundo plano o que as distingue, o que as separa, 
São caminhos feitos pelo respeito, pelo diálogo, humanizando as procuras, humanizando as procuras, fazendo um caminho de ombro mais horizontal e menos vertical, e nós vivemos neste momento esse processo. O nosso momento histórico é este momento de humanizar as procuras de sentido. Ou, numa expressão que ganhou também a forma, de um, a forma e a força de um compromisso escrito, recuperando uma velha intuição religiosa, de construir fraternidade, qualquer que seja a crença ou a não crença daquele que está ao meu lado. Construir este paradigma da fraternidade. E assim voltamos à pergunta. Que tempo é este? As estruturas de pensamento religioso baseiam-se num campo de reflexões, como nós sabemos, muito vastas, discernidas, sujeitas à ponderação, à tradição, à memória, à narrativa poética, à literatura, a um fio de compreensão que nos leva muito para lá do que é imediato, meramente palpável e visível. E então, se é assim, que tempo relacional e comunicacional, e comunicacional é este? Que tempo é este em que as religiões sentem necessidade de se afirmar? Entre a sedução do mundo, ouvimos esta manhã essa reflexão, entre a sedução do mundo digital, das redes, das bolhas, das tais bolhas manipuladas pelo algoritmo, e as palavras complexas de um livro fechado, sagrado, ou de um conjunto de rituais distantes da linguagem dominante, que é a linguagem da síntese, da velocidade, da palavra curta, do lead, qual é o espaço e o tempo nos grandes média para a religião? Eu diria pouco e normalmente vinculado apenas a situações que não são as melhores. Neste espaço em que nos posicionamos, denominado desenvolvido, mais urbano, intercultural, as estatísticas revelam que a religião, como outras dimensões da organização social, está a passar por um processo de desinstitucionalização. Ou seja, para simplificar, de redefinição. Há cada vez mais gente que se diz religiosa sem uma religião específica. Ou que se diz crente sem saber bem porquê ou em quê. A religião, num sentido mais amplo do termo, não acabou, como se vaticinava aqui há uns anos. Mas é cada vez mais uma experiência desvinculada de pequenos grupos, de pertenças limitadas. Vive com outros tons, com outras cores, multifacetada, em metamorfose, há até quem a considera, é um paradoxo, mas é um bonito paradoxo, mais espiritual e simultaneamente laica. Dirão que é preciso trabalhar a literacia religiosa. Eu reconheço que há muito pouco conhecimento e muita pouca cultura religiosa nas redações e nos grandes médias. Mas eu tenho outra percepção. É mais do que isso. Deixámos o tempo da bússola a bússola que indicava um norte, norte religioso, sabia-se de uma existência, de uma certeza que orientava, passámos ao tempo do radar, que varre, varre uma zona, percebemos que há qualquer coisa que se deteta, não sabemos bem onde ou o quê, apenas desconfiamos. Esta é a metamorfose que a religião ou as religiões enfrentam hoje. Há uma mudança no azimuth. E é importante aqui abrir outras possibilidades, os próprios agentes responsáveis pelas estruturas religiosas e pelo pensamento religioso, têm de abrir espaço e tempo para outras possibilidades de entendimento do seu próprio fenómeno. Perceber esta metamorfose. Isto é um tremendo desafio para as instituições religiosas. Há, como sabemos, zonas de colonialismo religioso, de ditaduras religiosas, mas não é esse o território em que nos posicionamos. Estamos a falar no território da liberdade religiosa e da dignidade humana. É aqui que se exprimem. Agora, outras perguntas. permitam a ousadia da retórica. Entre as verdades que constroem percepções e um conceito de verdade que se dilui em verdades efêmeras mediáticas, como dizer a certeza intemporal da fé? Como dizer uma verdade num tempo que desvaloriza certezas perentes para valorizar o efêmero. Este é o desafio maior das religiões. 
quando a religião deixa de ser reconhecida como relevante pelas opiniões públicas, é a sua expressão em liberdade que começa também a ser posta em causa. Em diversidade de liberdade, a experiência religiosa precisa de se afirmar como contributo e bandeira da dignidade humana. Afirmar a sua relevância mais transversal, social, com evidentes implicações na vida, na vida das pessoas, com tudo o que isso implica na valorização ou desvalorização de alguns dos seus alicerces. É uma responsabilidade dos atores políticos. É uma responsabilidade vossa. Não abdicar de dois dos mais importantes contributos da religião para refletir a organização das sociedades humanas. A esperança e a ética. E o respectivo impacto político. Não é por acaso que o Papa Francisco assume em muitas das intervenções que faz, que uma, uma das prioridades do nosso tempo é a reabilitação do exercício político e da política. E, no entanto, ouvimos lideranças religiosas uh, rechaçarem, a afastarem a sua responsabilidade política na organização política da sociedade. Têm uma tremenda responsabilidade. Não se trata de perspectivar aqui teocracias, não é isso que está em causa, mas de reconhecer que as religiões estão também na nascente produzem ideias, cultura, práticas relacionais e morais e têm uma palavra a dizer sobre os modelos de organização social e o bem comum. Trata-se de terem uma eficácia concreta na vida das pessoas, sejam crentes ou não crentes, serem atores. E para serem atores neste ciclo da história é importante entrar nos debates difíceis. Lá está, sem ter medo que os seus próprios alicerces tremam que isso faz parte do processo. Faz parte do processo. É um tempo de urgência de corresponsabilidade para reabilitar as liberdades, de estar lá nos debates mais difíceis, mesmo aqueles fraturantes, como há pouco se falava de manhã, aqueles difíceis todos, não estar lá, ter uma posição, mas perceber que eh, nesta sociedade tecnológica, hiper emotiva, pouco racional, polarizada, geradora de conflitos e equívocos, requerem-se outras ferramentas. E o reconhecimento de que as religiões falam em contexto de igualdade. Por isso é tempo de se abrirem umas às outras e de assumir e reclamarem esse dever ético de falar em igualdade. Porque não basta falar, é preciso ser entendido. Se estamos a falar sem sermos entendidos, o fruto é muito pouco. E por isso as religiões têm, de facto, de ouvir o mundo em mudança, sob o risco de se transformarem em núcleos acantonados de determinados princípios que, no grosso da sociedade, deixam de implicar e de relacionar as pessoas. Termino. A expressão pública da liberdade religiosa pode, deve e tem de ser cola social e cultural, contributo para a convivência na diversidade no respeito pela definição da dignidade humana. Se assim não for, acentua-se precisamente a erosão institucional das religiões e não sabemos ainda o que sobra. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. Now is the time to open. There's no time for questions. Paulo? I'm so sorry, Pedro. We have to close the panel. I am grateful to you for leading the panel, to all the people that work here, but it's four o'clock and we need to stop a little bit, okay? I appreciate it a lot, all, all the interventions. I think we all did, uh, but um, as Dr. Danun said, time is limiting our speech, unfortunately. <laughs> that's, that's the right thing to say. So we are going to stop for a moment. Uh, I think we have 15 minutes, we come back at 4.20, and we'll start at 4.25, okay? Thank you so much. <laughs>